Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and uh, welcome to our live stream audience from around the world. Thank you so much for joining our conversation today on the future of global health security, how to keep the world safe from future global health threats. My name is Michael Liu. I'm the dean of uh, the, the Berkeley School of Public Health, and I have the honor of moderating this extraordinary panel of leading experts in global health. We got so much to talk about today, so I won't read their bios, which are in your program. But to my left uh, is Dr. Larry Gostin, faculty director of the O'Neill Institute of National Global Health Law at Georgetown Law, and the world's leading expert on global health security. In fact, his recent book, Global Health Security, A Blueprint for the Future, is a must read for anyone interested in the topic. And to his left is Dr. Sue Desmond Hellman, former CEO of the Gates Foundation and Chancellor of UCSF, now serving on President Biden's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And I'm proud to add one of the most influential alums in the history of Berkeley Public Health. And to her left uh, is Dr. Art Rangel, Chair of Epidemiology at Berkeley Public Health and one of the world's leading experts in infectious disease control and prevention and one of our most beloved faculty and mentors to so many of us, me and Sue and so many public health leaders uh, around the world. Because we're live streaming this event uh, for better comprehensibility, uh, we, uh, as a panel, we decided to go without masking uh, because, you know, we're all vaccinated, boosted, and well ventilated in this room, plus the extra ventilators you see up front. But I know that some of you may still be worried about your own safety or that of others in the audience or in your network uh, with, uh, who might be more vulnerable. Uh, so, so I just kind of want to let you know, please feel free to keep your mask on. So we got a lot of advanced questions, uh, and so let's get started. So let me start with you, Art. Uh, and I know I keep asking you this to uh, predict the future, and you keep quoting me Yogi Berra. Uh, so I'm going to do it again, and feel free to quote Yogi. Uh, but what's after Omicron? Do you foresee uh, that the next variants to become less and less severe, uh, even if they're more transmissible and eventually become endemic, just like the flu uh, that, that, that we just have to learn to live with? Or how worried are you about the emergence of a variant in the coming year that can evade vaccine-mediate immunity, including per perhaps T-cell immunity? So thank you, Michael. It's a pleasure to be here with my good friend Larry and my former student, uh, Sue, <laughs> um, uh, to, to try and answer some very difficult questions. Um, so so uh, you're, you're right. I always quote Yogi Berra saying it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, and um, of course, the only thing people care about are predictions about the future. So um, at, at the risk of being wrong, I will make a few predictions. And then when we meet next year, uh, you can see if I was right or not. I, I think everyone knows this virus is not going away. Um, we will have uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus circulating in human populations for the foreseeable future. Uh, none of the vaccines we have uh, produce sterilizing immunity. And, and there's no reason the virus should be expected to disappear. Uh, we will have continued new variants. Uh, whether we will have a surprise new variant that's more severe uh, than the current variants, I don't know. Um, it's a possibility, but I'm going to hazard a guess and say that in general, new variants will move in the direction of, of Omicron, which is toward enhanced transmissibility, but, but not necessarily more severity. And I'm cautiously optimistic uh, that our, our vaccine uh, researchers and, and, and manufacturers will be able to keep up uh, and make uh, better and better vaccines that keep us protected against hospitalization and death. Great. That, thanks, Art. S soon, now, now it seems like now, now it's a race uh, between how fast the, the virus can mutate and how fast we can get the world vaccinated. And according to the New York Times, while globally nearly two thirds of the world's population have received at least one dose, 
57% uh, fully vaccinated, about 18% boosted, only 17% of the population in Africa and about 13% of the population in low-income countries have been vaccinated. What's driving global vaccine iniquities? Uh, what can be done about it? Well, the, um, let me just add my thanks for uh, organizing this panel. It's, uh, it's an honor to be up here with so, so much talent. Um, I, like so many others, I'm really unhappy about the low rates of vaccination in Africa. And the, um, uh, uh, there's a couple of uh, slogany things that I really like that I will say. Um, one is the, the slogan at the Gates Foundation um, is all lives have equal value. I really like that. It's very simple, and yet it says it's not okay for an entire continent to have such low access to vaccines. Um, the other uh, thing that uh, folks at CDC and other global health experts like to say is a, a virus anywhere is a virus everywhere, especially with a very mobile population. And so those low rates are not just a, a humanitarian issue, they're an issue um, for the emergence of variants. And there's a lot of concern, especially in South Africa, where there's so many HIV positive, um, undiagnosed people who are, are both immunosuppressed and not vaccinated. Um, it, here's the thing that I think is surprising. What's surprising is that a very um, common issue, whether you're in Nairobi or New York City, is vaccine hesitancy. The same anti-vax um, uh, propaganda um, has traveled globally. The same worries about the vaccine um, uh, have gone all over the world. And so even if we had enough vaccine for everyone, we would still be struggling with the communication and the trust issues mm. that we have right now. I do think there's good news. There's good news on several fronts. As Art mentioned, both the, the and, and I should say I'm on uh, the board of directors of Pfizer. Um, and so I've had a front row seat for some of the vaccine development, but developing um, new vaccines that are broadly effective against multiple coronaviruses will help us. Mm -hmm. Having vaccines that don't require very, very cold storage, um, that will be easier, especially for uh, tropical areas. Um, and lower cost vaccines uh, will also um, help with the, the global issue. So there's a number of reasons. Um, recently, the, the folks in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa have pointed out that people sending them either soon to expire vaccines, which is a real problem, or sending them vaccines without funding the kind of communication and uh, storage and uh, other facilities people need to uh, to give the vaccine is problematic. So we have a lot of work to do, but there's no reason the world can't vaccinate um, way more people than we have today. Great, th thank you. And um, I guess uh, on that note, uh, Larry, um, yeah, l let me ask you the same question. So, so what's driving global vaccine iniquities and what can be done about to, to get the world vaccinated against COVID as soon as possible? Well, I agreed with every word you said. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, f delivery is a, is a big issue, not just he hesitancy, but, you know, having enough vaccinators and, and, and transport and cold storage and all of that, I think is, is very important and vaccine supply um, is has has been an issue although it's starting to ease a little bit uh, in addition to, to hesitancy which we are seeing everywhere in the world um, you know I'd like to you know think about you know what the world will look like in a year from now in COVID in terms of vaccine equity but also in five years from now um, when the next um, uh, pathogen hits, and, and it doesn't have to be a pandemic, but it can be a very serious outbreak. Um, to me, the most important thing is to um, enable countries to make uh, vaccines and treatments themselves. 
and not rely on donations. In my view, the, the idea of charitable donations from rich to less rich countries, which has been the pre, pre, prevailing um, and dominant way that we've done equity, is, 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 is outdated and it's never been any good. We, we saw that with H1N1, where even you know, a, an internationalist like President Obama agreed to share some of the vaccine, but once there was a big problem in the U.S. and a lot of scare, he, he pulled back on that, and then it turned out to be not so bad, and then he gave. So uh, people in Africa and other parts of the world always know that vaccines come too little and too late. <laughs> Same with drugs and personal protective equipment. And a whole. So we need to do that, and I think the um, WHO, um, uh, messenger RNA hubs in Africa are a really good start. Um, I think you know we need more serum in institutes of India, um, and we need to be able to transfer the technology and make those um, uh, allow people to um, not to have to rely on others. We don't like to rely on others for our needs, and I don't think anybody would want that. And so. We have to look, you know, what have we learned from this pandemic? It's been two years. And, you know, for me, um, even before the pandemic, global health equity was the prevailing narrative of our time, you know, you know the haves and the have-nots and the 1%. But it's really accelerated and become very amplified during um, COVID-19. And I think there are ways to change that paradigm in the future, if only we have the will to do it. Thanks, Larry. And to hold that thought, I want to come back and dive deeper into the idea of vaccine as charity. But, but let me kind of bring Art in. Anything else that you want to add, Art, in terms of the drivers of global vaccine inequities and what can be done about it? So, so I want to push back a little bit on a couple of things. One is that uh, people in my line of work say it's not vaccines that keep us safe, it's vaccinations. Um, so you can have all the vaccines produced anywhere you want in all the storage facilities you want. And if we can't get them into people's arms, they accomplish nothing. Um, so, so this issue of, of delivery is obviously critically important. But I'm a little uncomfortable. I've, I've been working on vaccines for 40 years and um, <laughs> being confronted with people who are not happy about vaccination of their children for, for just that long. Um, I, I'm very concerned, however, that the, it's not just hesitancy. I think hesitancy is, it really doesn't describe the scope of the problem that we now have, uh, particularly with regard to disinformation on the web and other places. The virulence of anti-vaccination sentiments, um, certainly in this country and, the, and the, the extent to which they become political, uh, to, to me is, is a serious problem that we somehow need to address. Uh, so making vaccines locally is great. Giving people the wherewithal to deliver vaccines within a country is critically important. We need to find a better way to convince people uh, that, that uh, vaccines are a good thing. And, and, you know, historically, we did a pretty good job with measles vaccine and polio vaccine and other vaccines and, and, and convincing people uh, to take them or to give them to their children. But I think that the landscape is different now, and I'm really puzzled about how to fix that. Thanks, Art. Uh, so I'm going to put you on the spot uh, here. There have been calls to President Biden and other world leaders to waive IP rights, intellectual property rights, uh, facilitate technology transfer in order to expand and diversify global vaccine uh, production and distribution. As a former CEO of Gates, and Executive Pharma, including board member uh, Shabbat Pfizer, what's your view on temporary IP waiver and technology transfer to accelerate achieving global vaccine equity? I, for me, I start with the philosophy. All lives have equal value. So that means if you're Pfizer, if you're Merck, if you're J&J, &J, you want the products that you make to be available to everyone. The, at Gates Foundation, we used to talk about having a toolkit of a number of different tools 
that we could use tiered pricing, occasional charitable donations, although philosophically, I'm totally with you, Larry. Yeah. Um, you know, you have a toolkit. There's a lot of different things. The, um, one of the favorites in the toolkit would be to license a technology to Serum Institute who commits to low cost. Serum Institute makes 80% of the vaccines for Sub-Saharan Africa out of India. They have a wonderful uh, um, track record of safe and effective vaccines. Um, it, among the things you could have in that toolkit is some way that you can treat intellectual property. Um, the, today there was an announcement about Pfizer um, uh, putting their small molecule pill for COVID into this patent pool. Yeah, they had said that a while ago. Yeah, right? yeah, they had committed to it and they did it today. Mm -hmm. So there will be um, inexpensive uh, Paxlovid mm -hmm. available for the world. W what I get nervous about, and I'll just say, you know, these are I'm torn about these things because of my fundamental beliefs. I get nervous about a company that puts a ton of money and investment and says, okay, we won't make a cancer drug, we'll make a COVID vaccine, and then the state comes in and takes your IP. Mm -hmm. I mean, that doesn't feel like a sustainable way to operate. You know, I'm a capitalist, but I think capitalism should work for people. Um, so I, th I would want to look really closely at, the, at how you do that um, in a way that you still have healthy businesses mm -hmm. that make us the next vaccine we need. Um, uh, but I think everything's got to be on the table, especially when you're in a global pandemic and people are going with that. So, um, yeah, Larry, that, let's come back to this idea that, that you mentioned in terms of treating global vaccination as charity. Yeah, as of this month, donors have yeah, pledged $11 billion in financial assistance and 2.1 billion doses to COVAX. And yes, so far, only 341 million doses have been shipped to low-income countries. Is COVAX working? What's working? What's not? Uh, and uh, uh, do we need to do something entirely differently in order to achieve global vac vaccination as quickly as possible? Right. Well, I'd be very interested in your views on this. I mean, COVID, as, you know, I love the idea that you're an idealist, that you start with what's right. So I would start there with COVAX. It, it, it was the, you know, the act accelerator and COVAX is the uh, vaccine arm, um, you know, had its heart in the right place. It's, it's, it was intended to be the world's equity driver. It, ne it, it failed, um, or it certainly did not fully succeed. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, one of them is, is that countries got to have it both ways. They got to sign on to COVAX and have pre-purchase agreements, and right at the beginning, the you know high-income countries in Canada, U.S., Europe, um, U.K. Um, hoarded a lot of the early um, supply with these pre-existing uh, purchase agreements. That was one problem. Funding was another problem, um, and you know also their uh, Covax's uh, vaccine allocation formula has come in for some um, criticism. Um, and so, you know, right now, uh, uh, WHO's got an, an IMB, an intergovernmental negotiating body, to, um, uh, to negotiate a pandemic treaty. Um, um, uh, one of their co-chairs, Precious, is a very close friend. I'm sure you know her very well. She's really committed to equity. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I hope that um, out of the, you know, the crisis and the lack of solidarity and inequity that has come from this pandemic might be turned into an opportunity. I don't know that that will happen, but it would be very, it would be uh, inspiring if it did. And it depends upon what the treaty will say, what it will do. I think that equity um, and innovative ways to think about equity and, and a future act accelerator needs to be, um, you know, thought out very carefully so that next time it succeeds. You know, it's interesting yeah, that, it, it, and Larry, it's, it, for me, I was surprised COVAX failed in its mission. I mean, it definitely did, yeah. despite good intentions. Um, 
And it could have, even when the money came slow, you could sort of ramp it up. But not yeah. everything has to be fully funded day one. I was surprised specifically because I am so positive about Gavi. I was about to say so Gavi. The, the, yeah. the Global Vaccine Alliance <clears throat> has, has helped millions it's of children around the world. It's a huge success. It is a beautiful thing. With, mm. And it's an example of tiered pricing. Yeah. There's there's tender to offers. There's you know this is a very business like way to get countries what they need. Yeah. And Gavi does big fundraising and people commit money to it. And and Covax was a little bit of like a nephew or a niece of Gavi, I thought. And I thought they'd be able to use the the those same fundamental principles of equity and. Um, figuring out where the money needs to go, because a lot of the Gavi money goes to delivery, goes to getting things uh, um, to, to the children who need these vaccines. But I think, in, and you mentioned this, Larry, that, that kind of scram in the scramble to say, my citizen, you know, if you're the premier of a country or the president of a country, everybody got nationalistic all of a sudden. And so they were signing things and they were, they were giving speeches telling their citizens they would get their vaccines. And so it wasn't, um, the atmosphere did not enable COVID, uh, COVAX's success, and it wasn't really set up for success. Just for our audience out there who may not be tracking Gavi and COVAX, yeah. can, can you explain the difference in terms of how those two work? So Gavi is the Global Vaccine Alliance. It's a, um, a, a, an organization that does fundraising and then uses those funds to work with UNICEF and others to have low cost vaccines get to children in poor countries. And the concept of Gavi that's interesting is you graduate. As your country's income goes up, you'll graduate from needing subsidized vaccines. So it's actually a pretty cool idea and it, it is based on the notion th that it is literally pennies to save a ch child's life from for measles or not have a kid paralyzed because of polio. I mean, these are fundamentally the most cost-effective, beautiful things, vaccines. And Gavi's been around for a while and is very successful. You, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a great point because Gavi should have been the model. And I don't know what, what it was um, uh, that, that made it not succeed. You know, part of it, I think, was just things don't seem to go well. We don't plan for crises. And, you know, childhood vaccinations have been, you know, ongoing. Everybody agrees with them and, and they had a better flow to them. Um, and, and so we have, to, we have to do a lot better um, pandemic preparedness um, and anticipate these problems in the future because we know that they're going to happen. It's so true. I mean, the best public health is um, very... Um, predictable and similarly you get in the car you put your seatbelt on right mm -hmm. your child is is four weeks old you, they get this vaccine like the, the vaccines and other public health measures work when they're predictable reliable and citizens are like oh yeah well, that's what we do you know we put our our seatbelt on we get in the car and I think COVID-19 in general and COVAX specifically was sort of like all this you know it was the opposite of those kinds of familiar, this is, it, it, that's why people do tabletop exercises and treat these, I mean, that's why the word security is in your book. It, they treat it almost like a military thing because you have to use different principles than routine childhood immunization or seatbelt use or other public health things that, that uh, I just like the reliability of day-to-day -day public health things and the question is how to bring that same reliability into crises. Yeah, well, and, I, love and that. I think what, what, what the two of you are, are talking about can really raise a, a much larger question about our approach to global health. And, and so let me kind of bring, bring Art uh, into this. Our, our, uh, I know you've been pretty uh, critical about the, the kind of parachute uh, epidemiology that's been going on in global health for, for decades. Explain what you mean by parachute epidemiology and what must we do differently in order to improve global health equity? So um, I started my career in global health working for the CDC, uh, studying meningitis in West Africa and the effectiveness of meningitis vaccines. And the model was really simple. I got on a plane, I, I landed in the country, I collected my data and my specimens and I brought them back to Atlanta uh, where we analyzed them and published our papers and made recommendations. 
There was absolutely no, at that point, interest in building capacity locally to do any of that work. So that's what I call parachute science or parachute epidemiology. There's no attention paid to building local capacity. So for the past 40 years, I've been trying to make up for that uh, with, with funding from the NIH, from Fogarty International Center. Uh, here we now at the school have money from Gilead, for example, to <clears throat> a very generous donation to help us with that. But, um, uh, you know, it's, it's easy to talk about building local capacity. It's, it's not a short-term uh, endeavor, right? And, and so just to think about, you know, all the wonderful people I've worked with from many countries, uh, we bring them to Berkeley, we bring them to whatever U.S. or European institution or Australian institution you want, and you give them great training. Um, you, you, and, of course, you want them to, quote, go home, uh, and to contribute and, and build capacity there and supervise and train people there. And it's easy for me to say, sitting from my privileged position in Berkeley, that you should go home, uh, uh, even though you have a family and children and uh, who you need to educate. And so there's the whole question of, is there infrastructure? Can they, will they get a salary that's high enough to educate and feed their children? Um, can they really use the skills we've given them? And that's not, a, that's not something you can fix in a few years just with a grant from NIH. Um, it, it's really a much longer term and much more expensive endeavor if you really want to build capacity. Uh, CDC has done some of this with its network of sites in different countries, but it, it, to me it's, it's something that is, takes decades. It, it really can't be done uh, by bringing some, a few wonderful people to, to a, a wealthy country to learn modern things uh, because there are a lot of challenges to them going home and using those, those tools. Um, so I don't know that I've made a difference over the past 35 years, but at least I've changed my model. And I do have a bunch of questions kind of later on, you know, to these advanced questions about building local health systems uh, capacity and public health capacity. Okay, but, can I just say one other yeah, quick thing? Because it relates to the capacity issue and what, 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 what Larry and Sue were talking about before. I, I think it is the case, uh, demonstrably the case, uh, that we're used to the idea of Gavi and others vaccinating little children or paying for vaccines for, for infants. There's not a country I know of that does a comparably good job vaccinating adults. Um, and we in the United States do a pretty terrible job of vaccinating adults for the most part. So it's, it's, it's really a different paradigm uh, that a lot of people just aren't used to thinking about. I, I do want to uh, kind of turn our attention to the home front, uh, which uh, COVID-19 certainly has, a, has been an epic failure for public health here in the United States. Right? And, and this doesn't take away all the great heroism of the, 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 you know, many of our public health colleagues, uh, without whom I think the toll of COVID-19 would have been you know, worse by, by orders of magnitude. Uh, but but the, the numbers don't lie, right? With nearly a million deaths uh, in the US uh, at a moment when the American public really needed public health, uh, that, that our public health system really failed to protect the health and safety of the American people. So this is a question for, for all of you. Uh, what went wrong? What are some of the most important lessons that the U.S. should learn from COVID-19? And I'll start with you, Larry. Well, you know, I think you, you have to start with public trust. Um, you, know, the, you know, right now, um, Omicron and, and BA2 are so uh, infectious that we're seeing even in the best responding countries like you know, South Korea and Japan and um, uh, you know, Taiwan and even China that uh, we're, we're getting surges. But in the two years um, that the reason it was surprising that the United States, the UK and the Europe performed so badly um, and uh, particularly since you know, I'm, I'm on the board of advisors for the Global Health Security Index, and they were ranked at the beginning as being at the very top. U.S. was the first, as Trump trumpeted. Um, and so why? Um, you know, a lot has to do, you, know, you, you can give all the advice you want, but if people don't listen to your advice, 
And if there is a cacophony of different messages, you know, from political leaders and governors and presidents and, and CDC, and it becomes, you know, deafening and maddening. And, uh, and it's very sad. I mean, the two things, you know, would have thought that the, not only, Michael, your question is so good, but you could even say it, what we, we've been, what we've been through for two years should have made public health stronger and it's made it weaker. Um, public trust in CDC and even state and local health agencies has, has gone down. Um, the public health workforce has been um, dispirited. S some have fired, some have left. Um, when they should have been heroes, they've been castigated, they've been threatened. Um, just, I mean, even the federal level, look at what's happened to Tony Fauci. What's happened to all of us, I get, you know. Um, these threatening uh, messages. So it's, it's um, I think if I were to put my finger on just one thing, and there are many things, um, it would be, it would be the, you know, the, the lack of public trust because at the beginning, before we had the vaccines, um, we, we, we really were limited to non-therapeutic interventions. And if you need the population to, to comply with that, and they didn't, whereas they did in, you know, in, in, you know, particularly in Asia, you know, parts of Asia, and, 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 uh, and I think that's, you know, I would point to that as the major reason, but not, this, not the exclusive reason. Well, let, let me push you a little harder on the, the issue of public trust. Certainly public health depends on, uh, on public health. Uh, trust. If you were to kind of look back at the last two years, uh, what were some of the major mistakes or missteps that really eroded uh, public trust in public health? And what, what can we do now to restore that public trust in public health? Well, I don't think anybody knows the answer to your last question. I mean, it, we, we just literally don't know, although I, I can hazard some guesses. So, um, let me start, you know, I can give you a catalog of problems with uh, the previous occupant of the White House and all the problems that happened at CDC and even FDA. I can catalog them all. But before I do, we have a, we have a, um, a, a problem. We don't trust government. In the United States, you know, and it's we, you can see it from from uh, uh, polling and data from around the world. We're about the bottom, and you know, Europe and the UK are you know close. To, we're, we've become, I like to say, um, uh, you know, it's all about you know what are my rights? What's my autonomy? What's you know my liberty? Um, and we've stopped saying, what do I owe my family, my neighbors, my community, my country, my world, um, and the common good? We've lost that tradition. It, and it, you, know, you can go back in the United States. It wasn't always that way. We, you know, people talk about the Wild West, but it was a very well-regulated society, including firearms and a whole range of things. Um, and even you know, uh, John F. Kennedy and you know, Ask Not What you know, your country can do for you, what you can do for your country, LBJ's uh, Great Society, War on Poverty. What's happened in America? I, I've lost a lot of confidence in, you know, just our ability to be kind and to care for one another. And that's what, you know, at the bottom of it all is really just a respect for the other, a decency for the other. And we seem to have lost that because it seems to be so much about me. And I think that's, you know, so it started with that. And then, you know, the, the miscommunications and bad messaging and all that from uh, the White House and various public health agencies throughout. I mean, I can go through examples of, the, I mean, at one point I wrote an op-ed which said, you know, what could CDC be thinking? <laughs> you know, what, what, what? <laughs> what you know and so um, but I would start with the, just the kind of fundamental distrust in government and 
uh, and, the, and the kind of me society. So for you, the, the biggest lesson learned uh, from COVID-19, and then kind of thinking back to the last two years, what were some of the biggest missteps or mis uh, 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 and, uh, and mistakes? Uh, and now that you're advising the Biden administration through PCAST, what, can, what should the administration and Congress be doing to make sure that we're better prepared for the next pandemic? So, so this neighborliness, I'll, I'll use the word neighborliness because I like that word. Um, boy, do I want to endorse that. But um, a, a couple things that, that really strike me. First of all, one of the things we shouldn't forget is COVID-19 is actually really hard. SARS-CoV-2 right. is point. hard. It is a virus that's respiratory borne and you can transmit it when you have no symptoms. Like that, that's hard. Being able to be, be uh, um, somebody who passes along a virus when you're not sick. I mean, think about that. That's a really powerful, important thing. I, I uh, um, had just gotten to Gates Foundation when Ebola struck in West Africa. And we were, remember how terrified we all were? We were like watching the nightly news and seeing the plane with the guy. <laughs> it was just, it was kind of nuts. You don't get Ebola and spread it and, you know, look like us. You, you, you're really sick. Um, so we over-indexed on uh, um, being terrified of Ebola. And I think we under-indexed um, during the entire pandemic on really specific things. And this got to, I think, some of the CDC and FDA challenges early on. W what is... COVID-19, how do you get it? How do you protect yourself? How effective are the ways you do? Um, the, the, uh, we were talking yesterday about surgical masks and whether they were, you know, we ought to know that. It ought to be really crystal clear. So I think that, that this was, and people have mental models. People kept wanting to make this flu. <laughs> you remember, it's like that. It's just like the flu. It's just, every, so I think that that was very, very challenging for people, uh, just getting your head around it. But the number one thing that, that I feel like didn't work in the U.S., we don't have a, a working public health system tied into CDC with data that you can link to our medical care system, which is also very troubled. We talked about that last night. It is a huge problem. Mm -hmm. So as a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, I'm co-chairing the public health section. And it, trying to figure out, we are knee deep in trying to figure out what are the tactics, what are the things to do to strengthen that so that we have a working public health system that serves this country. Um, I think that could go a long way on the trust, a long way on the data. I, I asked this, uh, uh, the question to the group a couple of months ago. Why, when I have a question about COVID-19, do I find myself either asking about the UK or Israel? That's weird. Like, there's a whole bunch of smart data people in America. But I always want to know. On clinical trials, I always want to know what the UK is saying. On data, I always want to know what's going on in Israel. They've got health systems, like the national health system in, in the UK, that allows them to know what happens in everybody in the UK. And so thinking through a health system, including a public health system, and data that are reliable and can inform decision making and inform the citizenry. Like we're all citizens, we, you know, we we deserve to understand what's happening in our country. So, 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 so let me ask your thoughts about that that public health uh, data infrastructure, right? Because in the 21st century, in the middle of a pandemic, many local health departments were still using papers and pen, you know, fax machines and desktops, uh, which you know, certainly. Uh, cause considerable delays with potential deadly consequences. Um, what would you advise the Biden administration in terms of what this nation need to be doing to make sure that we're okay, bringing our public health data infrastructure up to the 21st century standards to create a 21st century public health data superhighway? So 
So the, the administration has already, through uh, um, funding, I think it's a billion dollars, funded a complete revamp of CDC's data system. So in the midst of that, I think starting with what does that look like and putting a huge emphasis on two things. One is the connection of the public health department to CDC and back, you know, just you give and you get. Um, but the other thing is something we all live with all the time um, and is, is something that, um, so if you do a home COVID test, if you go down to CVS and get a COVID test or, or the government mails you one in the mail, now we're all worried about our tracking because you do it at home. There, there's these things called smartphones <laughs> that could take a picture of it. Yeah, like there, there are tech, uh, techniques that are much more self-service, and we we fail to use self-service much in public health. So I would love to see a revolution in local pu public health departments, because it would also help the the extremely hardworking folks in public health departments with their workload, um, and people like to get involved with things, you know. So I think we need two things: CDC connected and back back and forth, and much more self-service. Well, I'd love to also get, get your thought about how do we improve, innovate, and transform uh, the, the public health uh, data infrastructure, but also kind of your thought in terms of uh, you've been advising Governor Newsom and with all this federal and state money coming in, what can we do to revitalize California's public health system? So on my desk, I have a 19-page document of a group that's advising the legislature about how to do this in California with their recommendations and asking for my thoughts about their recommendations. Um, but, but before I get to that, I think I need to you know, just follow up on a couple of things that uh, Larry and, and Sue said. I think you know, some people don't seem to quite understand our Constitution, and I'm getting into Larry's territory here. Um, but but we are not Sweden, we are not Israel, we are not the UK, we are 50 states and half a dozen territories and a, and a few Native American tribes who are each sovereign when it comes to public health. So we are not one system. And the only way that the federal government can make sure that Wyoming does it as well as California, as well as North Carolina, is to either bribe them or, 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 or coerce them, okay? So, one over the other. So, so uh, people may know that when, when I, I think this is correct, when the federal government decided we should all have right turn on red, some states said, we're not interested in right turn on red. And the federal government said, fine, then you don't get any federal highway transportation funds. And guess what? All 50 states changed their laws to have right turn on red uh, because they were forced to do so under threat of losing their federal highway transportation funds. So, PulseNet is a good example of a system that the federal government has paid for and put into basically every state to monitor foodborne illnesses using modern technology that's the same in every state. But if you're relying on each state to pay for it and to do it a particular way that is common and sensible and modern, that's not going to work. So maybe we need a constitutional amendment uh, that, that says health is no longer a state matter, but a federal matter. Uh, Larry, you'll tell me why that's not very practical. But, uh, <laughs> no. Or how do you think about something like um, uh, neonatal blood sampling, where there's like all 50 states do it and they have their own committee and everything, but they do that as a, a kind of critical public health thing, all 50 of them with CDC. So it can be done. I think it can be done, but how you get it done, if you're not either paying for it uh, or, or coercing all states to do the same thing and use the same technology, modern technology, I'm not smart enough to know. I'm not a political scientist, right. but Larry will. So know. you can't coerce states to do it. The, courts have been, the Supreme Court's been very clear about that. You can coerce individuals. Um, you can coerce companies, maybe, but you can't coerce states. Um, you can incentivize states, um, and you know the, the highway funds. I think was was actually raising the um, uh, the minimum drinking age, um, okay. that um, and that the Supreme Court upheld that. But since then, it's become much more difficult. I mean, remember, um, for the first time, 
maybe er certainly since FDR, the Supreme Court um, struck down uh, federal incentives to states to expand Medicaid. Um, and even when the federal government paid for virtually all of it, a lot of um, states um, said no. Um, so, yeah, there are, federalism is often thought to be our strength, you know, the laboratory of the states and all that, but it's also clearly a weakness too. There are other, fe I mean, uh, Germany is a federalist society, um, at, and, but it's got much more coordination. Um, but it's, you know, I, I don't, I'm not optimistic that we're going to be able to get that kind of harmonization among states. It is a, it is a significant problem, particularly on data and, and other areas. I mean, uh, the one other thing I'll say, so, so you know, this, for California, this list of things, uh, I, I have a couple of perceptions. One is that they're very happy to spend federal money, um, but it's not clear to me they're willing to raise taxes and spend California money on a regular basis. I have to ask the governor and the legislature that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as long as they're spending federal money, they're happy to buy more stuff. Um, uh, but but, but um, so whether things are sustainable or not, we need things sustained. Public health is not a one-time research grant. It's an ongoing endeavor, and it needs to be sustained. Um, it does, and, and we've kind of lurched with, um, you know, emergency crisis funding for too long. You know, we saw that with Ebola. We saw it with Zika. Um, we've seen it with COVID, and that's that doesn't help in the kind of um, predictability and hiring and infrastructure that state and local health departments need, um, because it. First of all, the money's there only for a specific purpose and not for the infrastructure. Um, secondly, it can go away and does go away. Um, and so uh, we need to have sustainable state and local public health funding that, that's, that uh, it, you know, is predictable, that people can hire the best people, you know, retain them. Um, we do have a, you know, quite a broken state and federal public health system, I think. Um, that you know, we you know Congress could do a lot more with that um, than it, than it is doing. Well, Larry, I, I think you're raising a really important point about our federalist uh, system of public health because uh, you know, most okay, nations have one public health system. We don't. Uh, I think Ardu said that we have what 2,600 public health systems throughout the, the United States, mm -hmm. uh, and which. Now, uh, may have its advantages, uh, but, but certainly in a time of national health security threats, that that's, uh, kind of raises a lot of challenges as well. It, it would be kind of similar to uh, if, if we were to get a foreign military threat that we're relying on local militia uh, to defend kind of ourselves. But, but that, in fact, is kind of what's happening. And certainly in the early days of the pandemic, you know, states were fighting you know, each other to get PPEs and so forth. So, so given the fact that, that, that we'll probably continue to have a federal system of public health, what can be done to make sure that we're better prepared for the next pandemic? Well, I think that Art is right, actually, that it requires um, federal funding of state and local um, responses and readiness um, and not just the odd surge funding f when a crisis hits, but sustainable. You know, I'm on um, uh, uh, a National Academy of Sciences committee that's currently reviewing our COVID response, particularly CDC. And, you know, among the things we're going to be calling for is, is that sustained funding. Um, but also, if you have surge funding, it shouldn't, you shouldn't have to go back to the legislature at the time, you know, because for example, with Zika, it took over a year after President Obama had asked for the, the emergency funding. By that time, Zika was virtually gone. Um, and so you need to have a standing contingency fund for public health, but much more important, as you said, Michael, I think quite rightly, um, is the importance of, of having secure non-emergency funding so that we have a, you know, a, strong, a strong system 
in place. And then you've, you know, then you've got the problem, you know, we talked about, you know, COVID making it worse, you know, states have now curtailed public health powers um, and uh, they've restricted funding. Uh, it's become so political, public health has become so political. We talked last night about CDC be being political, it used to be tucked away in Atlanta, now it's, um, uh, you know, it's very much part of the Washington inside the Beltway. But it's also true with um, state and local governments. They're so political now. And it's not just COVID. I mean, just look at what's happening in you know, places like Mississippi and Texas around abortion and reproductive health services. Um, look what's happening with you know, firearms, which are serious public health problem. We just don't seem to be as you know, united around preventing harms and how we can do that. I was uh, in the Obama administration when uh, Zika happened and was just absolutely infuriated uh, that that emergency funding for Zika was held up by political gamesmanship uh, on Capitol Hill. And, and so, so the idea of you know, zero year appropriation uh, for, for public health uh, preparedness, I think that's critically important. And then sustained funding for the kind of coordinated federal, state, local public health system, yeah, that's the kind of commitment that, that I think we need to uh, make as a nation if we want to be better prepared for the next pandemic or the next uh, health security threats. I, I also kind of want to ask all three of you this question about combating misinformation and disinformation, especially on social media, right? Because you know, okay, dur during this pandemic, you know, like we... Uh, saw how that just spread like wildfire, and, and whether it's around masking or vaccine or, or you know, hydroxychloroquine, uh, certainly you know, cause a lot of unnecessary suffering and deaths. So, so um, right now, public health is fighting a losing battle uh, on, on all fronts you know, against misinformation, disinformation. So m what must we do differently in order to combat misinformation and disinformation in public health? And I'll start with you, Art. Oh, no, I think Sue should answer that question. Oh, no. I'll start with Sue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll You know, start. Because, because in class the other day, I took a survey of how many students were on social media, and they all raised their hands. And I said, so I'm, unless reading the New York Times online counts as being on social media, I'm not on social media. So, um, and they told me it didn't count. Right, that doesn't count. So, <laughs> so, so, you, you, this, this is actually both serious and super hard. Like it is really, um, to me, uh, more powerful and more pervasive in this pandemic, as you said, Michael, than, than I ever expected. I would, I would offer two things because I don't have a set of, of things I'm highly confident that we should do. The, the first one goes back to trust. When you don't establish trust during a pandemic, you hope that you can take a, a, a advantage of trust that you've already built so that you can help people, right? Um, so it's sort of like a family. If you have a family crisis, you hope that the family's been okay up to the crisis so they can carry on. And I think we need to think about our health care system, our public health system, and how Americans experience it, um, and not expect that um, if we don't have people experience it in a positive way, that they'll feel trust when something bad happens. So I, I think we have to anchor everything in that. Uh, the, the other thing is something I learned about from the climate change folks, um, and, and this is that there, there are some data, it's very academic, it's kind of small numbers, um, but let's say I know Larry's going to be just thrown at by vaccine lies and everything, or hydroxychloroquine, even better. I, I would say Larry and all the Larrys. Um, it turns out that, um, that there's a guy online trying to sell people hydroxychloroquine, and he's making a ton of money. You know, there's no data on it, but here's what I'm sure. There's some side effects. There's no proof of it. And the guy's making a lot of money. So I want you to be careful. So if somebody gets a, a preview of fake news, lies, propaganda, 
and and you don't treat them like they're they're um, not smart. You treat them like they should be respectful and like I'm concerned that you might hear this. Um, there was a small study done with women who had um, children getting their uh, immunizations, and this was the whole thing about Wakefield and autism and all these crazy stuff. You know, this happened. I know your child's going to be hitting these immunization milestones, so I want you to know you'll probably see some of this online, and it's not true. So there is a kind of preemptive strike that you can do. I've not seen it scaled, and I'd love to see data on that. But I do think that this, in, in many ways, the, the formation, and on Facebook, they, Facebook wanted people to join, join groups because it makes you enjoy Facebook more. It turns out that a lot of those groups became groups who like guns or anti-vax. So a lot of really um, anti-public health groups formed. That is so powerful. Um, and I don't know how you sort of come back after it's already established, but there is some, you know, you can vac vaccinate against fake news, it turns out, with real news. Larry, just uh, from a legal perspective, yeah, you hear a lot about kind of legal regulation of misinformation, disinformation on social media. Is that even possible? You know, the thing about, it, I'm, I'm not sure you can scale that, you know, because yeah. there's so, there's oh, just such a cacophony yeah. of different um, voices that people are hearing. You're also not going to stop people from using social media. We can't rely on social media to police itself, one, because it, does, it doesn't have an incentive to do it, but secondly, it's a really hard thing to do. It, even when, when companies want to do it, you know, finding it or even labeling it, they, the labeling of, of these things uh, are um, only a tiny fraction of the false information, and it leads people to believe that if it's not labeled, that it's accurate and it's not. Um, so it's a very, very hard problem, I agree. If, if, if there were one thing I would do, and I think this is a longer term solution, but I think it's the only thing we can do, and we've seen this done in smaller countries, you know, very effectively like Finland and others, is, uh, is um, uh, information literacy. Um, that is teaching young kids, and you can teach them, to separate what's uh, reliable and what's not reliable. Um, and, and, and you can have exercises in school that says, okay, here's this, you have to go out and research, is this reliable, is it not, and why? Um, and I think that we are very illiterate, um, at, particularly in the United States, not necessarily illiterate in that sense, but in terms of health literacy and knowing what to trust and what not, I know that even in the Georgetown community or Hopkins or wherever I work, you know, there's a lot of people that really don't know how to separate, um, you know, good information from bad information. And the truth is, what if I ask myself, you know, if I want to find out something for, about COVID or, or whatever it might be, I, I do this all the time. There's only literally about three or four websites that I will go to um, and feel confident. You know, CDC is, you know, is one of them. Um, and, you know, I'll, you know, sometimes WHO, I take that with a grain of salt, but yes, I would do that. Um, you know, Berkeley or Hopkins School of Public Health, um, the Mayo Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic, those kinds of things. I know that. <laughs> and, but that, that will leave the entire metaverse <laughs> universe um, susceptible to falsehoods and, and not explicit falsehoods, but just confusing. It's not just COVID. If you ask people, you know, um, about nutrition, you know, when they, even if they read the New York Times, they're getting bad information because it's the latest study, but it's not, you don't know what kind of a study it is and whether it's, whether it's really powered and, and peer reviewed, you know, it's, and, and so people say, well, you told, public health told me this yesterday and today, and they're telling me something else, but they don't realize that they're actually a quite durable truths. <laughs> um, true in nutrition, true in, in how you um, 
can make guns safer without even taking away guns from people, just making them a public health approach to, to firearms, and on and on and on. But, uh, but we have to let people give them the power to find what is the truth and to separate falsehoods from, from truths. And that's, you know, they've been, they've been done in other countries that where you've got much more robust literacy, but uh, it's, it's a big task. I have to say I'm not completely convinced that we could vaccinate or educate no, our not, way out of like misinformation, no. misinformation. So any way to like legislate or, no, or regulate not, our way I mean, out I of think, misinformation, disinformation, first of all, public health? First of all, um, we've got a First Amendment. Um, and we've got a Supreme Court that really prizes the First Amendment and you know, it pr prioritizes it over anything else. So you've got your initial problem of, you know, who do you censor and how and why and who makes that decision? Those are really hard. The second problem is, is that there's just so many outlets and so much information. Even a really wise legislator or regulator is going to have a really, really difficult time um, dealing with that. So you're right, Michael. I mean, the solutions that Sue and I have given, you know, uh, probably won't work. <laughs> um, I, I, also, um, I, I don't have a solution that's you know constitutional and and uh, um, acceptable to people um, because just as much as the fifty state uh, challenge that Art mentioned, freedom of speech um, and freedom to say anything. Freedom of speech, you still can't say, uh, yell fire in a crowded theater, I think. We think. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's still true. Um, so I, 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 I was really struck by, um, uh, not because it has to do with public health, but when, when the um, January 6th happened and, and people were um, talking about the vote counting machines, that our legal system was used to say, I'm going to sue this person who said my machines didn't work. I mean, I think what, what actually works really well in the U.S. system is suing people. Yeah, but you know what? <laughs> it's mostly working in the opposite direction. It's actually suing is creating oh, lies. Help me out and here. The, and the courts, <laughs> the courts have been disgraceful. We talked last night, something like one quarter to one third of all federal judges are Trump appointees. There, if you look at the, the range of decisions they've made on particularly COVID, a lot of them, you actually just, they're talking points from anti-vax websites or anti, you know, it, so, so and, 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 and the law has been used, it can be used as a sword for good, but it can be just as easily used for for inappropriate person. Look at it this way. Literally, you'll know this being in the administration, literally every single intervention that President Biden has put forward for, for, on COVID, literally every one has at one time or another been blocked by the courts. And even now, um, what is at the height of his authority, which is to regulate, you know, masks on uh, on interstate and international carriers. They're suing, and to your point about the incentives, they're all. Most of these lawsuits are being funded by right-wing groups that are. So it is, you know, I I wish as a law professor I could say that the law is the potential answer. Um, the, the, I just don't see it with the judges we've got. I mean, look at this. I mean, look at it. I mean, Texas now has a blatantly unconstitutional um, abortion um, law. And they've created a mechanism that insulates that Clearly, nobody disagrees it's unconstitutional, but you can't sue 
And so the Texas, stat the Texas statute is going ahead. The Texas Supreme Court affirmed it. The US Supreme Court affirmed it. And so if you have a Supreme Court that allows a state to completely circumvent what is under current doctrine, maybe they'll change it, but under current doctrine, completely unconstitutional, how do you have confidence in the judiciary? I mean, uh, convince me. <laughs> so, so Larry, can I, can I ask you a question? <laughs> yeah. Going back to your teaching critical thinking skills to K through 12 students, yeah. um, which is everyone I understood you to be talking about. Yeah. Um, I was. Um, Given some of the pushback these days in some states about what you can and cannot teach in school, I presume that that, that, that would be content free or content neutral, where you'd be teaching people critical thinking skills. Otherwise, it should be. Yeah, um, I mean, the the um, the left is not completely blameless when it comes to anti science. You know. Um, uh, um, uh, Kind of genomically modified seeds yeah. and foods, you know, for be an example. A lot of the um, anti vax with measles, you know, is in California on the kind of suburban left. Um, so it's not, it, it, you know, I think the right is worse, particularly now, but I don't, you know, I don't, um, yes, it would have to be content neutral. So just in the meantime, while we teach everybody critical thinking skills, and that the older people who don't have them die out, and they, they're replaced by younger people who do, mm -hmm. um, what about that's vaccine? A, that's a what about vaccine mandates? Well, I've always been in favor of them. <laughs> um, I suppose to me, in terms of vaccine mandate, the there's only really one question. It's an empirical question. If you if there's, a, if there's a good vaccine and you mandate it, will more people get vaccinated or will well, less? The answer to that is yes. Yeah. If, then I'm in favor. <laughs> That's why I, I have been in favor. But again, you know, like for example, the OSHA um, ruling, the Supreme Court struck that down. And the Supreme Court has now said that Congress has to specifically authorize a federal agency to act on health and safety, that would obliterate environmental protection. It would obliterate occupational health and safety because Congress is not, doesn't have the capacity to be able to foresee the risks that there are. And that's why they delegate them to agency career professionals, scientists and others, to try to you know, regulate risks as they occur. And the Supreme Court has, since FDR, granted wide discretion. Just think about you know, what we've done with the Clean Air Act or the Clean Water Act or any of that, or OSHA rules. Um, that's all changing. Um, and I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a worrying way, the capacity for, for, state, for federal health and safety regulations, so far the courts have kind of upheld state and local regulation, getting back to public health regulation, getting back to the federalism point you were making, Michael. Um, but even there, I'm a little bit worried, particularly on religious exemptions um, for vaccinations. I think the court is poised to do something differently. It hasn't thus far, but I think it's poised to do that. I have this theory about the Supreme Court. I know what they're going to decide. I know what they're going to decide when it comes to immigration, abortion, voting rights, um, and campaign financing. It doesn't matter what the issue is. I know what they're going to decide, and I'm always right. They do decide that way. They just do. <laughs> There's some areas you can't predict, but not many these days. Is, is when you talk about vaccine mandates, it's interesting in the midst of all the kind of toing and froing um, uh, and discussions of pushing back on the Biden administration is how many companies have really stepped up. I, I think that's um, positive. 
It is, and they're starting to step back now. But yes, mm -hmm. it is very positive. Well, look what the companies are doing with, in Ukraine. In you Ukraine. know, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think that's. Um, it is both. Um, I, I think it, it's compelling, and it also gets right to the heart of something that I, I am puzzled by as much as I'm puzzled by the trust issue. I'm really puzzled by. Um, a very practical issue about um, particularly vaccines, but vaccines, masks, everything to prevent COVID. I, I really like if my colleagues, my family, my community are alive. <laughs> you you know? would think everybody would agree. So, so this, this, you know, this sort of chest beating, freedom, liberty, all this, um, I just find it really startling um, uh, that people don't take a step back and say, boy, I wonder somebody Somebody could go in the hospital, die, all of this. So I, companies, you know, it's one of the, the positive things about capitalism. And there's downsides to capitalism. But one of the positive things is you're supposed to do things that keep your, your workforce productive, happy, engaged, and making money for the, the company. And, and healthy. hopefully yeah. healthy yeah. and doing great things. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's been really, whether it's Ukraine or, or to this discussion, COVID, Many, many companies, I mean, companies that I've been interacting with not only have, have bent over backwards or flexibility, put in new air things in their building, masking, make sure everybody's vaccinated because they're protecting the employees together. And, you know, if, if your desk is protected, I'm protected. Um, so there is much more of a sense of community and a positive nature to protecting you from COVID. Um, and somehow that, in general, I think there's probably exceptions, has been effective in more companies than our federal discussions. Yeah, so, so just to uh, follow up on that, that point, how, how does something like masking became such a symbol of the cultural war that's going on in this country? travels together. You know, it's, it's a COVID thing. Um, and, and I think particularly uh, um, as people have become tired, you know, two, two years is a long time, um, that it's, it's more symbolic of frustration and not, not enjoying being told what to do. I don't know that it's any more, <laughs> more special than that. Yeah, it's been, it's been dizzying to see how just kind of neutral things, you know, uh, you know, a, a biological vaccine or a mask um, or distancing or whatever it might be uh, that they've become so political. It's tempting to always blame the last guy in office, um, but I think that would probably be an oversimplification, but it has been in, you know, and you know, you look at, um, political leaders, even at the state and local of many, many state and local levels, and they're, they're saying, you know, at, the, at, at the CPAC, I tweeted about this because it just, um, Ted Cruz began his talk by saying, by, to large cheers, I don't see a mask or a vaccine in this audience. Now, what, he's a Harvard educator. I mean, that's what worries me about saying critical the skills, yeah. the thinking skills are all we need to teach people. <laughs> I mean, you just have to say, you know, have we lost our, our compass, <laughs> our moral compass? Uh, I don't know. It's really something. Well, let, let, let's take our conversation more globally. So, so Larry, you authored the most authoritative book on global health security. What is global health security and what must the world do to better prepare for the next pandemic or the next global health security threat? Yeah, it's amazing. That, that book got the, got the best book in biological science and a lawyer wrote it. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Uh, the, the, you know, I don't know. There are a lot of things. I mean, we've been talking about them throughout. You know, um, you start with strong health systems, um, uh, uh, and you you um, and then it goes. It does. 
it's well beyond COVID because you know there are lots of um, things that are really, really important now, like um, antimicrobial resistance. You know, it can be a really major existential um, threat. Um, uh, how do you how do you how do you prevent or mi or mitigate at least um, uh, zoonotic spillovers? You know, in terms of uh, you know s things like regulating wild animal trade and markets, um, not having such close congested interchange between humans and animals, um, uh, and. And it just on and on. So basically, it's you know, it's health systems, it's data systems, it's having good um, international institutions like the World Health Organization. I've got a paper coming out in the Lancet on sustainable financing for WHO. Um, uh, it's about um, uh, you know public health powers nationally and globally. It's a whole range of 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 things, but I think we certainly have wide agreement, and I think wide agreement among all of us and all of our colleagues, that there is a certain core set of things that we could do to make our world a lot safer than it is now. Um, that's what the book was trying to do, but you know, basically the book only gathers the, th the thinking of you, um, and just kind of tries to pull it all together. But I think that you know we we really kind of know what to do. We're just not doing it, and we're not funding it. Yeah. And and I do want to dive deeper into some of the things that you just talked about. But but let me kind of bring Sue and Art into this. What okay, what should the world do differently? Yeah, like help us kind of reimagine. Uh, the, the future of global health security. What should we do differently to make sure that we're better prepared? Well, I do think we need a stronger WHO or something like WHO if it isn't WHO. Um, uh, you know, there are areas in which they're very effective, but, but they struggle in many ways. Um, and, and so how you make that more effective, I guess people need to read. Which chapter is it, Larry? Uh, one of the chapters. <laughs> one of the chapters, okay. Um, so so, so I, I think we, we do need to strengthen a number of international organizations, and whether it's around laws and treaties or whether it's about WHO, I think that's a critical uh, right. piece and of also, it. Sue said, you know, a lot of global public-private partnerships like Gavi, CEPI, have been very, uh, very important. You know, and maybe it's possible, Sue will have more to think uh, say about this, uh, you know, what, maybe it's possible to engage uh, corporations and the private sector more mm -hmm. uh, in this. The, you know, as you say, they seem to have stepped forward in a number of positive ways uh, in the context of COVID. So maybe they can be convinced that this is in their best interest uh, if it doesn't become too intrusive or uh, you know, difficult for them. So I don't know what the role of the private sector is, but, but maybe Sue, you have some thoughts about that? Yeah, no, I, th I, I think it's, um I had a couple of thoughts about this, and the private sector specifically um, has a, a both, um, at, le at least in the pharma and biotech, want to make a difference, and, and their staff um, is eager to contribute to global health and what's going on in the world. So I think new models, and I think um, the models that we've had are okay, but I think we can even do better on, on getting people the things that they need. The, the other thing that we haven't talked about, but I just, um, especially given the times we're in right now, avoiding war is really important for global health security. Um, it, there is, it's horrible for people to be in a war zone. And mass migrations. Mass migration. Also connect to epidemics and yeah. outbreaks. So, so what's happening now to the people of Ukraine and what has happened in Afghanistan and many other places Dislocated people, people living in places um, where they're close together, it, it's it's awful for them. It's awful in every way, and it's awful for their health. And then I think it's it's also awful when people le live in deep poverty. That is not a recipe for for their health, and that affects global health. It's not a surprise that we saw Ebola 
or Zika come out of some places in, in uh, Brazil that were really, really tough areas. Mm, yeah. Um, and, and the thing that WHO, I think, uh, um, I, I, there's a lot I want from WHO. <laughs> but among the things I'd like from WHO is the, um, they do serve a normative function. That's their best asset. If you're in any country um, in the world and say, I'm going to treat somebody for HIV infection, you, WHO will tell you what to do. You know, they can say, here's our recommendation. That normative function is extremely valuable if you're not in a rich country. What I've seen less from them is a function of, of global health security. So pandemic, look ahead for pandemics, how they... Uh, um, act in a pandemic. I don't think it's in their toolkit, and I think they need it to be. Yeah, post Ebola, they did, you know, form the, their health emergencies right. program. Um, they never were an operational um, institution. They started to become one now. I don't know quite how effective they've been. I think in the in the Congo, they were fairly um, helpful um, in the Ebola. Um, in the Ebola outbreak. But I have a question of Art and Sue. Do you think that we are going to see a pan-coronavirus or a pan-influenza virus vaccine? Do companies have incentives to actually produce that? Um, how likely is it scientifically? You had mentioned it earlier, and I just, I've always wanted to ask two really smart you know, scientists uh, that question. I'm sorry. Uh, so we need Tony Fauci here, obviously. Um, I'm not an immunologist, and I don't play one on TV. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's an issue of corporate interest. I mean, Sue can correct me if I'm wrong about that, but, but I think it's a difficult scientific problem. Um, and is it achievable scientifically? I, I don't know the answer to that, but it seems to me if it is, uh, that it'll, it, you know, there will not be opposition because I'll make less money by not selling, you know, an annual flu shot. Um, Definitely not a, a corporate. <laughs> pro if anyone would love to have either of these, the um, Gates Foundation has been funding um, uh, efforts to look at a, um, a global flu vaccine for a while now. It's it's actually hard. Was it this year's flu vaccine was 17% effective? They said it was really Virtually, pretty, pretty close to zero, yes. Oh my, yeah. oh, my God, I didn't need to, 17%. So, so that's, we need better, better uh, flu vaccines. The thing that's hard about, um, so I'm not an immunologist either, um, but among the things that are challenging with the coronavirus vaccine is, we're seeing in real time its capabilities, <laughs> you know, that, that, that we have Delta and then we've got Omicron and, uh, um, the, and the latest. It, it, we really need a pan-coronavirus vaccine really and companies would love to have it. And the other question is, is why does this vaccine seem to lack dur durability compared to other vaccines? You know, just a couple of days ago, Pfizer uh, put in an emergency application for a fourth dose for plus 65. I mean, what, what's going on? And is it, does, and is our mRNA vaccines not as good as we thought, that we hoped and thought? Um, is it something about this virus? But I think there's a certain bewilderment and fatigue among the population. I need to get, you know, how many times are you going to ask me to put a dose in, you know? Yeah. A, and so what, how do, you, how do you explain that to the public? Yeah, I don't have an explanation. We need to have really good data to explain that. The, um, I have been surprised at the lack of durable effect, um, as you are. And, um, and I don't know we'll be able to compare AstraZeneca's, J&J's, Moderna, and Pfizer's to look at duration. Novavax. Um, and Novavax coming, coming around the bend. Um, so, so it's not yet clear. It, the other thing I worry about, I will tell you, is these, the duration 
we often will measure either cellular or right. humoral immunity. Mm. And what I care about is, are you, are you going to get sick? Are you going to mm -hmm. go to the hospital or die? And so we need better data. We don't know. But by the way, I will say, um, I have this great photo. I, 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 I'll bet I'm not the only one in this room. Um, the day I got my first um, uh, vaccine, and I was just like, I, I was so grateful. We all were. I was so grateful. I, I, I will tell you, you can give me 10 of them and I'll still be grateful. Yeah. So, so, you know, among the things I'm worried about, we, we need to understand duration for sure because people get tired of it. But um, having a vaccine that is that effective, super good. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all agree with that. It's just, you know, I think there's, in addition to kind of COVID risk mitigation measure that fatigue, I think that's part of the you know concern of the oh, yeah. of the public. Oh, we should understand. And myself as well. I don't quite understand it. We need better vaccines, more effective vaccines, but but also we need what I think you mentioned in the book, a new international agreement. Um, pandemic preparedness, uh, and I think in, in, in the book and also in a recent JAMA pa paper, you mentioned a, a number of different components to what that uh, agreement would. So, so I'd love to, I want to make sure we save some, some time for audience questions, but I'd just kind of love to get, get your thoughts on, uh, on a number of these components uh, for international agreements. So, so first of all, you talked about preventing spillover, right? So I'd love to, well, first of all, Art, what's a spillover? Secondly, Sue, uh, people have been talking about uh, you know, creating an early warning system for a long time now. Uh, we have an early warning system for tsunami. We have an early warning system for earthquake. Why can't we build an early warning system for, uh, to monitor spillovers uh, or to, uh, to, to detect uh, early outbreaks? And then uh, Larry, uh, so some of kind of what's driving spillovers, of course, you know, okay, the deforestation and the urbanization, and then just the, the, the harvesting, the, the relentless harvesting of wildlife and, and wildlife traits and, and so forth. And, and the U United States and, the, and China are responsible, I think, for about 60% of all wildlife trade, illegal wildlife trade going on. What are some legal options to make sure that, that in addition to like shutting down wet markets and things like that, what can we do to, to, to reduce uh, wildlife traits uh, in order to prevent spillover? So, so start with our, what's, what's a spillover? So, so first of all, um, you know, um, wet markets, uh, so spillover is when a, a, a pathogen, primarily a virus, uh, moves from a, an animal population into a human population. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it's Ebola, whether it's HIV, whether it's uh, COVID, uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 or SARS-CoV-1, that's fundamentally the arrival of a new pathogen into a human population, uh, which more often than not has no immunity to it. Um, so you have pretty much everybody being susceptible. Um, you know, people have obviously talked about closing wet markets. Uh, so you may or may not remember, but a number of years ago, we used to have wet markets here in San Francisco. Uh, because people of certain uh, groups preferred to buy their chicken alive uh, or their turtle or whatever they're going to take home and cook as part of their culture for millennia, probably. Um, and the, the closing them was a non-trivial cultural, uh, drew a fairly vigorous response from the affected community. Um, and that's true in a number of other countries. Uh, so it tends to drive underground uh, some of these behaviors rather than eliminate them, it makes them so I don't know whether the right thing is to ban uh, everything. Larry will tell us about that, uh, or, or, or whether to regulate it. Let's in some ban, way. Everything. That's <laughs> right. Let's ban everything. Um, but it's not, you know, the, some of these are very deeply ingrained behaviors. And we had a student a few years ago whose research was on the fact that in some countries, if if you ban the the uh, hunting, killing, and eating of wild animals, uh, you better find some way to replace the protein because these are marginally new, uh, people with marginal nutrition. They rely on the animals they're killing for, for their protein, and you better have a way to replace it, um, or otherwise it's gonna be a problem, right? So, so it's a complicated issue. 
you know, just very briefly the question of how do we monitor spillovers and how do we set up a global surveillance system for this? Well, A, you need a blank load of money. <laughs> Um, and you need a lot of epidemiologists and you need a lot of laboratories um, because it's a big world, right? And you don't know whether it's going to be in Thailand or Congo or Brazil uh, or, or Kansas, frankly. Um, so so you, you, it, it's a non-trivial problem. And, you know, One Health is meant to solve all this. Um, and my friends at Davis would be happy to explain how. But I think it's a really tough problem. The only thing I would add to, to what Art's already said, I, I think WHO and CDC are the heart and soul of the early alert uh, warning and should be the heart and soul of that. Um, one thing that I've been happy about during this pandemic is the resurgence of uh, the popularity of uh, sewage sampling, wastewater sampling. Mm -hmm. It is an incredibly powerful tool for looking ahead at things. Um, and what, how much it will scale for pandemic look ahead, um, I don't know, but I think it could be. And it's being used, in fact, it's one of the things I'm kind of nervous about right now is, is we've seen a little bit of an uptick uh, in some states in the US in the wastewater sampling as Europe uh, and Asia have been more affected with COVID again. And I think that that is, you know, if you, if you think about a very um, non-invasive, um, privacy enhancing way to monitor its wastewater uh, um, uh, sampling. And Sue was just to say that that will work better in a place with sewer systems? <laughs> yes and no. I have to say, see, I, I saw this up close and personal. So in Nigeria, um, the, the, uh, for our uh, polio sewage sampling, there was a, um, uh, sorry, it's almost dinner time, there was a, a river where people's waste was carried, like a creek. Um, and we did the sewage sampling there. Sure. So you don't have to have, you know, bells and whistles. And uh, um, uh, it, it can be done in surprisingly difficult areas. Fair point. Matt, Larry, legal options for preventing spillover and addressing wildlife trade? Um, well, for a start, um, it's going to be hard because you have to have um, international agreement and people have to abide by it. So again, using the Ukraine example, you know, every country in the world, I think, just about has signed on to international humanitarian law and the Geneva Convention, including Russia. But if they don't actually comply with it, and we saw a lot of that with the international health regulations, it's a problem. So you need an international uh, agreement. You need to be able to, 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 to gain some compliance. You know, maybe part of the answer is just more transparency and to try to hold um, countries to account better um, through that kind of transparency. Um, but also normatively, I mean, I think we, you know, we have to find agreement on you know, the kinds of things that are really harming us as, as humankind. You mentioned a, f a few of the really critical ones, Michael, um, you know, deforestation, um, overuse of, uh, of antimicrobials in, in animal and even human populations, you know, prescri you know indiscriminate prescribing, um, uh, wet markets, uh, wildlife trade, um, you know, uh, you know, even in areas that, that are not pu public health, like you know, the trade in ivory um, and and exotic animals, um, you see, uh, it's very, very hard to stop. But that doesn't mean we can't try. We should, we should have. I think we should have international agreements on all of those things. And I think, you know, although you're not going to be able to enforce it there, I think there are certain compliance enhancing ways to do that we do, you know um, there are a lot of possibilities um, shadow reporting by civil society can be you know quite good it's been you know fairly good in in, in human rights um, uh, incentives and sanctions um, would be possible I'm currently writing an op-ed on how to um, how to do better with international humanitarian law 
um, with the Ukraine response because, you know, what is it now? Something like 38, 39 documented cases of uh, bombing of humanitarian corridors, hospitals, maternity wards, um, you know, things like that that are clearly violations of international law and what we, what we can try to do to harden that. Whenever you get to international, it becomes really hard problems because, and it's getting worse, far worse, because countries have become more populist, more nationalistic, more in it for, for themselves, um, and they're insisting on their, and, and, it's, and it's the really powerful countries that are making most of the insistence, but not all of it, you know, I mean, uh, China um, would be an example, Russia to a certain extent, the United States under President Trump was very, very nationalistic. But if you think of even the you know, reasonably effective international n instruments like the PIP framework, the, it's a WHO negotiated um, pandemic influenza preparedness um, uh, agreement framework. It's called the PIP framework. So the, the PIP framework is intended to share virus samples um, and to equitably distribute the benefits of vaccines and drugs, which is a really good thing. But then a group of countries um, ha signed a treaty called the Nagoya Protocol, which is a treaty in the PIP framework, isn't? And that treaty does the exact opposite of what you want a treaty to do. It basically says, viruses are my sovereign territory and I won't share them with WHO or GISRIS or whatever it is. And, you know, that's, you know, so we're talking about hard problems. Of all the hard problems we're talking about, getting international <laughs> agreement and, and buy-in into things are really the hardest. But, but, I'm an, but I s still insist we have to try. An, another area that, that you mentioned for the international agreement is around assuring biosecurity and biosafety. And, right, you know, and uh, right, right. So, so, so this mm. is kind of where, where you know, and I'll, I'll open it for, for okay, any of you. What do we can really know in terms of what happened in Wuhan? And how strong is the evidence that this came from a wet market versus a, a, a laboratory leak? Mm -hmm. Uh, and then Daniel there's Bell. been a lot of kind of back and forth between like Fauci, you know, Dr. Fauci and Ted Cruz and Rand Paul about this kind of gain of function. Can, can one of you explain to our audience what, what that was all about? Yeah. I'm of the belief that it was an, a, 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 a natural spillover in the market. Um, but, but, you know, you need to be a very sophisticated virologist to understand some of the intricacies of what people have tried, evidence they've tried to put together uh, in support of one theory or another. Um, and the notion that perhaps the laboratory there had isolated it from some person or animal and then it escaped from the lab, uh, that's different than saying it was engineered in the lab. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Art. I mean, I think. You know, there's a saying in medicine that, that that what you know what's most probable is probably right. And when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, yeah, not right. zebras. Exactly. And so, <laughs> what's something like seventy percent of all the you know spillovers of emerging infections? You know, so so you begin with the idea that that's probably what happened. But there are also some really you know the, not not complete evidence, but good evidence. The most recent one is they did, um, uh, where the outbreak occurred in Wuhan by the wet market, they did um, uh, some sampling near animals that are most likely to have um, had the spillover effect. And they, fa they found SARS-CoV-2, you know, on the, on the equipment, on the cages and things like that. And that was, it was reported as the closest thing to a smoking gun. Now, can you rule out um, the, uh, the, the, the Wuhan Institute of Virology? No, you can't. And absolutely, China should be a more, a better global citizen and allow the kind of 
um, investi independent investigation of the origins. Uh, and so, and so, so the China Morning Post asked me the question. That's when they were free in Hong Kong. <laughs> I don't know if they are anymore. Um, they said, uh, would the, would, let's suppose it, it happened in, in the CDC high security lab or in Fort Detrick or something. Would we allow an independent scientific investigation international? I said, no, no, we wouldn't. But I'd have a lot more confidence that whistleblowers and civil society and transparency in the, the United States would come to a, a, a tr more truthful conclusion than I am confident of that in China. So I really agree with what both Art and Larry said. The, 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 a gain of function experiment is, is a thing that you're doing some kind of genetic manipulation on a virus. So for example, it could become more infectious. That's yeah. gain of function. Um, the, it, the, it should not be done as a shouting match between Rand Paul and Tony Fauci. However, I think a reminder to all of us of lab safety, a it's reminder. A thing. It's a really good thing. So <laughs> I actually think that is th that is useful. You remember smallpox found in the you know the corner of some lab. And, yeah, and, and, and NIH and CDC. <laughs> exactly. So so it's. It's easy to take for granted that everything that happens in a lab is safe. So I welcome that. It just needs to be apolitical when we discuss things like that. Yeah, and that's one of the things in the pandemic treaty that I do mention in the JAM article, which is the and the book, which is the idea of better um, laboratory security. I wanted to open up for for questions, so I'll just call out a, a few of these other areas. You know, strengthening and monitoring inspection and compliance, uh, promoting research, scientific sharing and transparency, uh, strengthening health systems, and that's a lot of what we've been talking about. But I do want to ask this last question before we open up, because I, I think this is kind of really important, which is advancing domestic and international health equity. You know, certainly COVID has laid bare the magnitude of disparities uh, and uh, and all the structural determinants, including political, legal, social determinants uh, of health disparities, both in this country and around the world, what must the world do differently, right? What lessons have we learned from COVID and what must we do differently to help advance health equity? I mean, should I start? Um, I mean, there are a lot of things we can and must do. Um, you know, the first thing is just simply ensuring that we address the social determinants of health. Um, you mentioned, Sue, the idea of you know, living in deep poverty is, is not good for your health. Um, some people ask me if I could choose one intervention uh, that would promote global health. My answer is educate women. Um, but there, but so I think getting to the, the you know the the deeper social determinants you know in in the Michael Marmot sense is it would be the first thing to do, and then to have much more equitable access to global public scientific goods and medical resources, I think is in, it would be a second thing that 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 I I would see, and you know and the whole. You know, I think part of the distrust we see, we heartening back, is an understandable frustration among so many people in the United States and the world that they've been left behind. And they have been. Um, there's just no question um, uh, that, that's, that that's true. And I think, you know, attending to that stark inequity um, and we, we, we've, you know, in our group, we've looked at, um, you know, kind of um, uh, equity action plans and things. We've got a whole, we've mapped out a whole way of trying to do this. Um, you have to first count it, so you need the granulated data, granular data that actually show which groups are being left behind, whether it's based upon poverty, disability, gender, whatever it might be. Then you have to actually make meaningful efforts to try to correct. There's a whole range of things that you can do. 
I think, let me endorse the uh, educate women, but I think educate women and men. Um, education is such a massive um, uh, positive advantage for everybody, and you see it, I've seen it globally. Um, equitable health systems has a ton of stuff and not a short answer, um, but for me, the, the, um, it is social determinants of health. It's having healthy places to live and work and, mm -hmm. and go to school yeah. um, and access to those no matter who you are. And the last thing I'll say is it's investments. You know, I, I remember uh, with discussions about the ACA and some of the Medicaid that's been mentioned and everything, oh, this is going to cost a lot of money. We spend money on a lot of things that are a lot less valuable than education and health for people uh, in this country, and I would say that across the world. Yeah, we, 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 we devalue those I, I would just endorse those. I don't have anything to add to that. So we should see what questions people have. Yeah, yeah. I was actually just reminded that Veronica Miller's class is going to start in about I was going to say. seven minutes. Uh -oh. So, so why, why don't I suggest, let's go ahead, take a break now. Go ahead and get, get some food uh, out there. There's, uh, we have a light reception out there. Uh, and then uh, and then come back. And you know, I know uh, uh, okay, Larry's going to be here. Uh, and certainly, you know, Sue and Art, if you have time, we can you know, talk with folks out there as well. But, but yeah, if, uh, if you could. We will start the class at 645. Okay. You'll start the class at 645? Yeah, because oh. we want people to be able to go outside right. and network a little bit. That, that. Uh, so we'll start a little bit late. Possibly. Where will the class be? Will it? Right next door. Right, right next door. door. Okay. People can ask us questions at the reception, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, we're going to just go outside so you can ask out there because we don't want, we, we want Larry to eat something and we don't, yeah. Okay. But you're all free to go outside. Oh, it's great. Yeah, it's a few books. yeah. And, and please do join me in thanking our, like, just extraordinary panel. Thank you.